Hi everyone. So I'm uh, here to talk to you about what's new in MongoDB for Azure developers slash .NET developers. So I'm Lise Carter, a developer advocate at MongoDB and also a very proud Microsoft MVP. Now, for those of you wondering what developer advocate is, these days people know, but just in case, basically my job kind of entails being part developer, part product, part teacher. Basically, I get to go and learn new and cool things happening in the MongoDB space, teach it to you through videos, tutorials, and like today, um, giving talks. So I'm really, really excited to be here. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna start off with what is MongoDB? Then we'll answer the question, well, why MongoDB? More importantly for Azure developers, why MongoDB over Cosmos DB? Then we'll start to look at some code things around semantic kernel and Azure OpenAI. Then we'll have a look at uh, kernel memory and what that is. Then we'll end off with uh, MongoDB provided for EF core, what that is, why it's exciting. Then I'll give you some useful resources that hopefully you can go away and take a look at and get some value out of. So what is MongoDB? If you're watching this talk, you may already know, but I actually learned a long time ago to never make an assumption of audience knowledge. So for that reason, I just wanna take a couple of minutes to just do some basic explanations of what MongoDB is. So at its core, the main part of MongoDB is a document database. It's similar to a key value database, but it supports more data types like embedded documents. So essentially objects, um, dates, different types of numbers, um, and many more. It also stores information in collections of documents rather than tables with rows and columns. So a document is kind of a row and then a column would be a field in that document. As you'll see today, and if you've ever seen anything on MongoDB, it's general purpose. So it can be used for lots of different things, whether it's an operational database, vector database, time series database. We, you know, and if you saw, if you saw our customer list, you'd see that we really do cover a wide array of things. So very much general purpose. We also have a flexible schema. So you can have your documents in your collections be a different shape and size if you want to. If the thought of that frightens the life out of you, don't worry. We also have the ability to set schemas and data validation. So if you want your documents to all look the same, you can do that. But there are times when you're proof of concepting things that maybe you just want a bit of flexibility in what your documents look like. Plus we support horizontal scaling and historically that wasn't always as easy. So it's just, you know, one part of document databases that's considered a, a good feature. But MongoDB is actually more than just a document database. It is a full developer data platform. So we have the database itself. We have Atlas Device SDKs, which is basically a, a suite of development tools for working with things like on-device databases. So um, you might historically have heard of Realm, which we purchased um, a few years ago, which kind of acts as your local database. But you can take advantage of that local database to enable offline functionality while using device sync to handle keeping that data in sync as the network availability changes. Charts allows you to create various types of charts and graphs so you can visualize your data stored in MongoDB and you can even carry out pre-processing of the data before it even is shown. So that's cool, adds even more power. And Personally, I think Charts is one of my favorite products because I don't need to write any extra code with a third party charting library just to show patterns or interesting things about my data. Analytics is also useful because you can run analysis of your data and it even supports Microsoft products like Power BI. Lastly, we have Search, and this is a key feature of what you'll see demoed in this talk today. So we have two types of search. We have full text search, which is built upon Lucene's full text search engine. And this allows you to just search your data based on text without needing to code in integrations from third party search tools. And then there's also vector search, which allows you to search beyond just text. And we will discuss that in later slides. So that's what MongoDB is, but why use it over something like SQL? Well, MongoDB and document databases just make life easier. There's high availability. So, I won't get too technical, but MongoDB clusters are made up of three nodes that are kept in sync. So if the primary node goes down, one of the secondaries will be promoted to primary, so your database will just keep running. 
As we mentioned, it's also highly flexible. So the documents can have different shape and size and that supports that flexibility. It's scalable vertically. So like with relational, um, sorry, everything's relational. Like with SQL to databases, if the server needs more hardware to perform, it can. And it can also scale horizontally, as I mentioned. So historically, horizontal scaling was less common in tabular databases. So horizontal scaling was a big benefit of NoSQL databases like MongoDB. And MongoDB does this using something called sharding. So it breaks your data into groups, aka shards, based on an attribute you decide, and then spreads that data over multiple servers. And this is great when you have maybe millions of documents and you need improved read performance, for example, because a query can then use that shard key to know exactly which server to use to resolve that query, just saving time searching through all those millions of documents. And then lastly, there's readability. Documents just look like JSON documents. And those of us used to C family languages like good old C sharp are used to JSON documents. So it's automatically readable. But you can summarize all this really as build better apps faster. In the past, the most expensive part of databases was the hardware, especially storage. But these days, with reduction in cost of storage and processes, actually the most expensive and valuable part of data storage and application development is the developers themselves. So you. So why not make it simpler and easier for, for you to create awesome things? OK, Atlas. So we talked about MongoDB as a developer data platform, and a key part of that is Atlas. Atlas basically is MongoDB's fully managed multi-cloud database service. These days, it expands to be that whole developer data platform, including more than just databases, including the Atlas search and Atlas charts that we discussed earlier. But why would that matter to Azure developers, right? Well, this is a cluster deployment on MongoDB Atlas. As you can see, this is deployed on Azure in the North Europe region in Ireland. Even better, it's an M0 tier cluster, which is our free forever tier that doesn't even require you to share credit card details. So it's great for just trying and creating proof of concept applications without any kind of financial commitment. And if you're like me, you'll start a thousand side projects a year that you never finish. And it's super cool that you can do it without paying for it. So this clip here shows how easy it is as well to actually configure Atlas to create a cluster and deploy it to Azure. So we can just go ahead and click Create. It will bring up a wizard. You can then fill it out. So you can pick M0, and you can have one per project. There is a sample data set box, but um, you can load more later on that we'll see. You can pick Azure. Then you can pick which region you want to deploy to, and then just go ahead and click Create Deployment. If sometimes it will give you a, a nice capture box. Who doesn't love that? And then it will just go ahead, start deploying it, and bring up this guide if you want to. So you can generate your first user. You can add your IP address. And then it will talk you through other stages if you want to. And what's cool about MongoDB as well is if you just want to play around, we have a whole set of sample data. So we saw that little tick box, but there's actually more than just that little sample you get from that tick box. And this sample data comes in all shapes and sizes, and you can load it into any cluster. And it represents all sorts of interesting data, such as Airbnb listings, restaurants, movie, even shipwrecks. And loading the sample data is as easy as clicking load sample data on this overview page of your new cluster. After a couple of minutes, you'll then have an array of data to play around with without needing to make your own. But that's Atlas, and you're an Azure developer. So you might be wondering, well, why MongoDB Atlas over Cosmos DB? Well, as you may know, Microsoft offers this product called Cosmos DB with MongoDB API. And this is a NoSQL product offering that I think has been around since about 2017. But the issue is it's more of an emulation of MongoDB. So it imitates the features and doesn't necessarily always have full compatibility. In fact, one of the things we see a lot is that people often raise issues with the Cosmos DB with MongoDB deployment with us thinking we're behind it. And then you end up wasting more time trying to get help from the right place. And those differences might be OK for you and your application. And which you choose is up to you, because both have full pros and cons. You know, we are, we are you know, happy partners with Microsoft, which is exactly why I got the, the honor of being invited here today. So you know, it's not a competition. It's just about which one works best for you. But I do recommend that for, for the full experience, MongoDB and Spiffly Atlas is the way to go. But some of you might be thinking, well, why would I pay for Atlas when I have an agreement with Microsoft that provides Azure credits? 
Well, guess what? That doesn't need to hold you back because we have an official product in the Azure marketplace allowing you to use your Azure credits to pay for an Atlas subscription so you can get the benefits of Atlas without paying any extra. Woo, winning. Okay, so that's that's the kind of scene setting stuff and just giving you an idea about MongoDB and Atlas and some background info. Let's start actually looking at ways that you can work with Atlas and Azure products in your applications and some of the latest advancement, advancements in our, what I like to call long-standing partnership. And it's true. So first up is Microsoft Semantic Kernel and Azure OpenAI. Well, what are they? So Microsoft Semantic Kernel is an SDK available in multiple languages that integrates LLMs such as OpenAI and Hugging Face with programming languages such as Python, C Sharp, and Java. And it allows you to integrate out of the box community and custom plugins that can be chained together to achieve great things as a combo. You can use OpenAI or even Azure's own managed OpenAI product. Plus, it supports connectors for other storage endings for memory storage, such as, hey, MongoDB Atlas, Chroma, DuckDB, Redis, and others. Okay, let's look at a demo movie recommendation bot that I wrote that uses Semantic Kernel, Azure OpenAI, and Atlas. So this is a very professional-looking console application that I ran. So it asked you, tell me what sort of film you want to watch. So we can ask it something like, I want to watch something about music. It will then go away and pull in the information. So it will do a search for you. It will then give you the title, the plot, the year, and a relevant score. And we can even keep asking it questions like maybe we want something about sharks. And again, you get those results back really, really, really quickly, which is one of the things I love about the connector with Atlas and Semantic Kernel. That's a simple bot, though, that queries our, queries our data. So that's cool. And it was really fast. But how does it work? Well, as I mentioned before, it uses Semantic Kernel. So um, it uses the MongoDB Atlas cluster for storage and Azure OpenAI for generating the vector, embed in the vector embeddings using the chosen model. But uh, this, again, we try not to assume any knowledge. So what even are vector embeddings? Like I say, the mantra I shared at the start is I never assume any audience knowledge. It's good to understand at least a little bit of what vectors are and how that links to products like Semantic Kernel. So vectors are a set of numbers in an array that represent the data. Each number represents a specific characteristic of that data point called a dimension, and that's what's learned by a model in machine learning. How many dimensions or numbers in the array can be specified when the vector is produced? So basically, the more dimensions, the more contextual information it has to use to find you know, related data points. And producing these vectors is known as embedding. So something like the string here, quick brown fox, might end up looking something a bit like this, just with more numbers than the one you see. And obviously these numbers are just a bit random, but yeah, essentially if you generate the embeddings, you'll get something that looks a bit like that. But how does embedding work? Well, the data is sent through an embedding model, such as a popular one for text data called text embedding A002, which if you've, um, had any kind of, you know, touched on or dipped into any kind of um, AI stuff before, you might have heard of this model. And then the vectors are produced as the output. But the vectors that are produced need to be stored somewhere. And this is where a database like Mongo MongoDB comes in. You can store your vectors, often referred to as embeddings, in place in your database alongside the data. And it's just stored as a new field. And it makes sense to keep the fields containing the vector data within the same document as the data it represents, because it just helps improve performance. And this is what's cool about MongoDB. It can be both your operational and your vector database in one. And then the encoder in the middle, this is just a machine learning algorithm that can be run locally, hosted privately, or just called via an endpoint or API. And in Azure, um, this, you know, this will be where Azure Open, Open AI comes in. So it's a managed API for generating embeddings based on the popular Open AI models. And Open AI is currently, um, or Azure Open AI is currently in preview, and you can you can request access as a business by filling out a simple form. I say as a business because a few weeks ago, I think around Easter, when I requested access, it did make it clear on the form that if you had a personal account like Gmail or Outlook, um, it wouldn't be accepted. But once you've been approved, which I found happened quite quickly, 
You don't have access to the ability to deploy an endpoint linked to a specific model that you can take advantage of in your applications. And creating them is really simple. So we've got these two deployments here already. But if you want to make your own, all you need to do is click Create New Deployment, select which model you want. So at the moment, we have GPT-35 Turbo, Text Embedding ADA002, or Whisper. As you can imagine, we're going to pick the text one. Then for model version deployment type, it's, there's only one option, so that's nice and easy. Give it a name. I don't know, Azure Dev Day Demo Talk, or Text Demo, Text Model. I can't remember what I called it. There we go. Um, and then just click Create. And just like that, almost instantly, you have your own deployment. And that deployment name, um, make a note of it. Obviously, you did just name it yourself, but just make a note of it because, as you'll see, it will come in useful later. OK, so how do we combine these to perform a search of our data that we have stored? Well, first, we generate embeddings for the data you want to search. So in our case, we can use the Azure OpenAI deployment we just created. We can store those vectors as a field of embeddings in our database. But we also need to create a vector search index just to let the database know where to find the embeddings and um, what similarity function to use, um, um, which similarity function is, is essentially the um, search's way of how it will find what it wants. There's different ways of doing comparison. Then we need to create the embeddings for that search term, so both are available as vectors for comparison using that similarity function. And actually, thanks to semantic kernel, steps one and four are done for us automatically. And step two is just achieved with a plugin called semantic memory that we'll see in code in a minute. Ooh, there we go. So how do we do it in Atlas? Well, you can do it in a few ways via the Atlas Search API, the Atlas API, um, might be Atlas CLI, anyway, programmatically in code or via the Atlas UI in the browser, which I'll show here because in the browser is just much easier to see as a demo. So we can just, we've got our cluster here that we've deployed and it has the sample data loaded. We can just go into it and say, create a search index. We want to go under Atlas Vector Search at this point rather than full text search. You can see we've only got JSON editor as an option. We can go in, we can then specify which document, uh, database and collection to find the field that we want. And then we can give the name if we want. Um, and then we just have to fill in a couple of things. So first is the path. So that's the name of the field to find the embeddings. In this case, I happen to know that the field is called plot embeddings. We pick those number of dimensions, which is 1536. Then we pick that similarity function. So you've got three choices, but we're going to pick um, cosine as our function, which you cosine, which uses the um, angles between the vectors to find the similarity, just because that's what semantic kernel supports. And just like that, you have your index. Within a couple of minutes, once it's indexed all your documents on that field, you will get an email to let you know that your your search index is ready and you can start using it. Okay, so we have everything in place to carry out those steps. Let's see the actual code used to make that movie recommendation bot you saw earlier. Well, because we want to store information, search it, retrieve it, and remember it between sessions, we want to use that uh, memory plugin, which is accessed via a memory builder. So we set up the text embedding generation service. In this case, we're saying with Azure OpenAI, um, and we pass it in the details. So we have that deployment name that I mentioned earlier is worth remembering. Once you deploy it, you'll also get a um, endpoint, and then you've got your API key, your model name, and you know, anything else that you might need. In this case, that's all you need. We then create a MongoDB memory store using that connector, which is available as a NuGet package. And we pass it to our connection string. We just pass it the connection string, the database name, and the name of the search index we want to use. In this case, it would be that vector underscore index default value from creating the index earlier. Note, semantic kernel, though, can only work when the field containing the vectors is called embedding singular. So this is a feature, and we'll discuss a solution to that later. But for now, we can't use the embedded movies collection that we just created an index on in the sample data set because that field is called plot underscore embeddings, not embedding. And so for that reason, we just have a method that we can call that only needs calling one time called fetch and save movie documents, which solves that problem. So there's a few things that happen in this method. Let's just talk through it. First, using the MongoDB C-sharp driver, 
we've already got a client and a database and uh, collection defined. And in this case, we call it movie collection. So we fetch the number of requested documents from the movie collection. Then we loop through each one. And some documents have no plot field value just because we wanted to show what you know flexible data might look like. So some of them don't have a plot. So we just do some error handling by just replacing it with the word unknown. Then we just add each document into our memory store, assigning values to the fields in the way that's most useful. And by calling save reference async, it's not only saving it to a new collection in our Atlas cluster, but it also generates those text embeddings for us with Azure OpenAI at the same time. And it leaves us with a field called embedding. So this is an example document taken from the cluster that shows the metadata object containing the things we care about, such as the title, plot, and year of release. You could also use that additional metadata field just to store any custom schemas that you want to be able to generate or search against, should you wish. So this code looks a bit more complex just because I'm using the wonderful Spectre console library to make it look prettier. So you might have seen the green text color and the, the table with the headers and everything. But the main search code itself is actually really simple. We call search async on our memory, just passing it in the collection to search the search term um, and then how many results to return and the minimum relevance score we want. So if it falls below that threshold, we just don't consider it enough, accurate enough for what we want to see, so we just discard it. This then returns something called an IAsync enumerable of type memory query result. So we use an await for each, um, so we can loop through each result or memory and just populate the rows in the table before printing it out. And as you saw, it was super, super responsive. But you may have noticed a few things already with semantic memory and semantic kernel, which limit us or cause problems. Firstly, it only supports text as a data format, which isn't great if you want to take advantage of things like image search. Secondly, you can only use the cosine similarity function, which is best for less dense data such as text. So this makes sense when you consider point one, but it's still not great. Thirdly, it only supports C Sharp, Python, and Java. And those connectors and community plugins vary in their availability between language. So Microsoft, being the great company that they are, took these experiences, lessons learned, and feedback, and generated the next evolution, kernel memory. Kernel memory is a multimodal AI service specialized in the efficient indexing of documents and information through custom continuous data pipelines with support for retrieval motor generation, synthetic memory, prompt engineering, and custom semantic pro memory processing. So I took this from Microsoft memory, uh, kernel memory GitHub page, but that sounds a bit busy. So what does that even mean? Well, it just means it can support more data formats, including images, um, PDFs, JSON, Word documents, of course, still text, but just a lot more than that. It can also support hybrid search using and or filters and just move away from cosine as the only available similarity function for comparison. It can also support more languages than just those three. So you can have chatbots, maybe CLI tools, browser extensions and others, even low or no code solutions. Plus it supports a broader range of storage engines. And there's some other benefits that a few of my favorite. It can support RAG with sources look up. So you can create much more powerful experiences, including chat, without actually needing to code in your own support for the history and shared context. It supports custom storage schemas, which means that we can move away from that funny looking um, document shape we saw earlier with the, with the metadata bit fields containing the main things that we care about. And you can start using something that's in the shape that you want. It can support vector databases with internal embeddings, which means we won't have to generate embeddings for data that already has them, so we can get away from needing that field called embedding. As I mentioned, we found that, you know there's a way around that. That would be kernel memory. So where we, you know, where you've got the ability to um, use tools like OpenAI or Azure OpenAI and even Hugging Face and others to generate embeddings you now can store them in MongoDB Atlas and kernel memory will be able to use those without needing to go through the hoopla of um, pumping a bunch of documents in. And we can use even more LLMs, including LlamaSharp, and as, um, which means that we can have what I am naming here and now, TM, CalmStack, C-Sharp, Azure OpenAI, LlamaSharp, and MongoDB. 
We may even end up with Mac as well. So MongoDB, Azure OpenAI, C Sharp, and kernel memory. Now, you might notice I use Mongo, MongoDB in both those stacks, which leads us on to the question, if semantic kernel has a MongoDB connector, well, what about kernel memory? Well, of course. Thanks, thanks actually to an awesome member of the community. So it hasn't been fully tested by Microsoft in their full suite of tests. So although the PR has been merged, it's not available in the NuGet package for kernel memory just yet, but fingers crossed it will be available really soon. At the moment, I have this Blazor application. It's available on GitHub that I wrote using my, as you can see, amateur design skills to display movies available in the sample data set. But there's a search box at the top, as you can see, and depending on which GitHub branch you use, this is either doing full text search to find movies that match the title entered, or it uses vector search. And this is just a, a quick vector search in action. So we can just go in and we can type something. So maybe we want um, three men and swords. We can just click search. It'll go away and use vector search under the hood to find it. And hey, look, we find things like three musketeers, and other ones like Sword and the Sorcerer, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Dragon Tiger Gate, anything that it deems from that search that is similar to Three Men and Swords. Now, this example currently uses the MongoDB C Sharp driver, which brings in vector search as part of our advanced querying product called Aggregation Pipelines, which is available in nearly all our drivers. But what I would love to do is actually migrate this to use kernel memory and add a chat feature that allows you to have a full on conversation with the bot. So you can search on not just title or maybe poster image, but actually get recommendations via a full conversation. So you can ask more than just one thing, like something about music. Whew. Cool. So that's that's cool stuff with AI using Atlas and Azure. But what else? Well, I just want to briefly talk about something else. Entity framework, and more specifically, the MongoDB provided for EF Core. Many websites hosted on Azure App Service use Entity Framework. Plus, um, you know, re statistics and surveys by third parties show that MongoDB is the most popular NoSQL database for C-sharp developers. So it's not su no surprise that one of the most requested features of Entity Framework was a provider for MongoDB. So for a while now, Microsoft and MongoDB, as the great friends that we are, have been collaborating on a new provider for Entity Framework. And the exciting news is that on Thursday, this very coming Thursday, our .local NYC, so New York event, you will hear that the provider is going GA. Woo. I wish I was on my Mac now because I could play confetti. Um, but anyway, for those of you interested, here's just a quick snippet of some interesting things about the provider that you might want to know. So this is from another demo available on GitHub, which is using a tutorial I wrote and recorded on YouTube as well on how to get started with the provider. And it's just a demo of a car booking system, nothing exciting. So we have the car booking DB context. And just like with any um, entity framework code you already have, it just inherits some DB context and has DB sets for our models we want to store. We can also override the on model creating method if we want to provide further information on our entities. But is there anything special about these car and booking classes? You know, if, if it's a new provider and it's not using SQL under the hood, is there anything different? Well, let's look at car. The first thing to note is the use of this attribute here. So it's just a standard C-sharp object, this class, but we add the attribute from the provider just to tell it what collection to map to in MongoDB. The rest is just properties, apart from that special object ID, which is just a data type of the primary key in a MongoDB document. Um, and actually, when the provider goes uh, GA on Thursday, you'll find there's an easy way to not use object ID anymore, but actually use the string and get back all the string methods that you're used to and the, it will automatically handle mapping that between object ID and string for you, just like in the C-sharp driver, which really the provider is just built on top of. But the rest is just standard C-sharp code, and these other attributes you see here, if you've not seen them before, they're just standard web attributes, I believe related to MVC for a form. And then inside program CS, you just set up entity framework in the same way as before, but adding a DB context, then, you just instead of using something like dots use SQL server, you just have you dot use MongoDB and you pass your connection string and database name, then you can just use entity framework in the same way you, you're used to. So whew, that was a whistle stop tour. Well, the main things to take away from this are that MongoDB and Azure are great friends, 
no matter you know you can share your credits if you want to so you can enjoy atlas while taking using your azure credits semantic kernel with mongodb connector is the first step towards ai with an awesome storage solution you can combine that with azure open ai and atlas vector search to perform text-based queries and then kernel memory is that next evolution that allows you to do more than just text search Excitingly as well, MongoDB's provider for EF Core is about to go GA. And the main thing to remember, things are only going to get better. So there will be a link and a QR code to access this gist on the next slide that I'll leave up. But this is just a list of useful resources I think you'll get value from. They just include things like content and tutorials I've already mentioned. Our developer center where you can find lots of C-sharp and Azure content to get started. And as I say, just keep an eye out on Thursday for our .local New York, which will also be um, some of the sessions, like the keynote will be live streamed on YouTube. Then you can watch out for sessions later where you can learn more. Thank you. I'm going to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Luce. Uh, I'm going to pull your quote that things are only getting better. I'm going to keep saying that our products can only keep getting better, and especially when we get feedback from the community. So yeah, join the live streams, comment, comment on these videos. Uh, let us know what you think, what you use, what works well, what questions you have. That's how we make these products continually improve and get better for your experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'll, I'll be in YouTube chat for a while after this. If you've got any questions far away, yeah, I saw a whole bunch come in, come in already. So I think uh, amazing. You'll have I'll be sure to go and answer them all <laughs> while we enjoy the next amazing session. Yes. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest no of your day. Thank you for having me.